Welcome to Bethany Online as we uh, celebrate Reformation Sunday. Reformation Sunday is uh, October the 31st, or the Sunday closest to October the 31st, because October the 31st was All Hallows' Even, the night before All Saints' Day. A big holiday at the time of Luther, and Luther posted on the church doors so that people would be able to see his 95 statements, things he wanted to discuss, things where he thought the church had lost its way, and he wanted to discuss what was going on with those things. Wanted to make sure that people were reading the Bible, knew the Bible, understood the Bible. And in those days, people didn't have Bibles. So, and the priests weren't even always reading Bibles. So Luther started a firestorm, if you will, uh, one that he didn't expect was gonna be a firestorm, but he started the Reformation. And he was also one who said that it always needed to be a Reformation. There always needed to be change because we're always falling back into certain sins. So we welcome you. We welcome you to Bethany Online. We're glad you can be with us, regardless of what day it is or what time it is, as we celebrate Reformation Sunday together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Well, come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms to his open arms for God so Our reading for today comes from the book of St. Paul's letters to the Roman people in the third chapter, starting at the 19th verse. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now apart from law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction. Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. 
It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes a boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law. This is the word of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace is yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for today is the uh, lesson that I read from St. Paul's letter to the uh, Roman Christians in the uh, third chapter, and I'd like to reread a, a smart, small piece of that to you. Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. My dear friends, 
all. All is the word. And all is a word we struggle with. All. Jesus died for all. It's a really difficult concept. It's not so much as a difficult concept as it's a difficult reality for us to accept or want to accept. If I'm brutally honest with myself and with you, I can say this. There are people that I do not want Jesus to die for. There are people who have done things so evil that I don't want them to be able to receive forgiveness of their sins. There are people I've known in my life people that I just didn't like, people who did hurtful things to me, people who I just couldn't get along with. And it's hard for me to even think about God wanting to forgive them. I have a hard time wanting to forgive them myself and struggle with that. I think we all do, don't we? We struggle with that. There are people that I do not think should have a chance to be saved. And maybe you have those people in your life too. I am sure you can name some big historical figures who've done some outrageous and horrible things. The reality is we may find that there are a lot of people, a lot more people than we would realize, who've done horrible things and we look at their lives and we wonder why God would send his son Jesus to die for all. And how is it that God could love us so much that Jesus would come and die for all? In reality, this is my sin. It's our sin that we look at people and we see them. And we don't see them as brothers and sisters in Christ, but we see them as people who are doing hurtful things and we want them to not get anything but what they deserve. And when we think about it and we're honest, we can recognize and we can start to logically deduce that we too have those same thoughts and feelings And while we may have refrained from some of the actions, the sin really is ours. When we want to take away forgiveness from others, what we're taking away from them is life. Because forgiveness is connecting us to Jesus and connecting us to God. And God is the one who is life and love and peace and joy and all those things. Without God, none of those exist. So it's our sin. It's our sin, but it's not original to me or to us. We can see it in Cain and Abel. The first ones to show this exact sin, Cain kills his brother. He kills his brother because he sees in his brother one who will do what God has said, who offers a perfect sacrifice, and God doesn't like Cain's sacrifice because it was imperfect. Abel offers his first fruits. Cain does not. Abel goes and does willingly what God has asked. Cain does not. And it leads Cain to a place where hatred spills over in his life. And finally, he kills his brother Abel, hoping that this will take away his problem. But rarely when we lash out, rarely when we harm people, does anything good come from it. In fact, I could probably say never, because there is sin there every single time. So it's not just about hating evil people. Sometimes we hate good people. Sometimes we hate people that we look up to and should admire, but we're jealous of them. We have envy for what they have or what they've done or who they are or how they act. That's the problem with sin in this world. That's what brokenness does to us. It brings us to a place where the law quickly condemns, where the law holds us accountable before God. And we have to finally realize that no human being will be justified in God's sight by the law, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned and all sins create equal problems. We like to argue about whether one sin is greater than another, but the reality is the equal problems that they create are that we are a rebellious creation. We are separated from God because of our sinfulness and our brokenness. Whatever I do that's wrong, and there's lots of that, is equal in its problems to whatever you do or whatever anyone else does. So for me to sit and to say, I don't want certain people to receive forgiveness, I don't want Jesus to die for certain people because they're too horrible, is negated at that point. Because all have sinned 
and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us are in that same pool of wretchedness and brokenness and separation from God. And that's where Jesus comes in. People have always tried to rank sins, always tried to say this one's better than that one, this one's worse than that one. If you do this, you're really bad, but if you do that, you're not quite as bad. And I can argue that the impact of some sins and some brokenness is worse than others. Sometimes we do things that are wrong and very few people notice. Sometimes it impacts a lot of people. We can do it by numbers, or we can do it by whether it takes away life, or we can do it by all kinds of other means, how much pain it creates. But again, Jesus comes to pay for all sins, not just the sins of those we think should receive it, not just for the sins of the people who've done the little things, but for all people and for all sins. Sadly, the church and the people who are the church, the people who are in the church, the people who believe in Jesus, the people who have faith, consistently and throughout history fall into the same broken pattern, which is that we want to justify ourselves. We want to say that some of the things that we have done are okay. We want to say that somehow some of the things that we did that were bad weren't that bad. We want to elevate ourselves and elevate our lives when in reality it just doesn't work. It doesn't work because anytime we're trying to elevate ourselves without just simply saying that we receive forgiveness from Jesus, we have to push other people down. We have to judge. Recently, somebody shared with me a uh, devotional that came out from a, uh, a guy named Henri Nowan. Now, when you look it up, you might, you might see Henry Nowen, but I looked up the pronunciation, listened to it, it's Henri Nowan. And Henri wrote this, imagine having no need at all to judge anybody. Imagine having no desire to decide whether someone is a good or bad person. Imagine being completely free from the feeling that you have to make up your mind about the morality of someone's behavior. Imagine that you could say, I am judging no one. Imagine, wouldn't that be true inner freedom? But we can only let go of the heavy burden of judging others when we don't mind carrying the light burden of being judged. Can we free ourselves from the need to judge others? Yes, we can by claiming for ourselves the truth that we are the beloved daughters and sons of God. As long as we continue to live as if we are what we do or what we have and what other people think about us, we will remain filled with judgments, opinions, evaluations, and condemnations. We will remain addicted to the need to put people and things in their, quote, right place. To the degree that we embrace the truth that our identity is not rooted in our success, power, or popularity, we can let go of our need to judge. Do not judge, and you will not be judged, because the judgments you give are the judgments you will get. That comes from Matthew chapter 7. Those are the words of Jesus. We've been told not to judge. We've been told we're free from our sins. But it's hard to live that. It's hard for us each and every day because we are still living in the now and the not yet. The now is a place that's filled with our brokenness and our sin and our original sin which makes us want to do things that are wrong, with temptation that overcomes us, with judgments of other people. But Jesus has cleared the path so the day will come when we will live in heaven where there is no sin, no judgment. The final judgment has happened and God has judged us in light of Jesus. And in that gift of faith has made us, as we said last week, holy and blameless and undefiled so that we will live in God, in Christ, with God, who will give us life eternal and who will make sure that we understand that life and that love and that peace that can never be taken from us. The Christian church and God's people stray from the truth throughout history. We stray in many and various ways and need that forgiveness all the time. That's what Luther's Reformation was all about. 
pointing out that only God could erase that sin. Only God can make us holy and blameless. Only God could give us that gift and that we could go out and share it. It's always about what we must, the problem that we run into in history, the problem that we run into as we stray. It is always this one that we think life is about what we must do instead of relying on God's gift of faith. It happens so easily. The temptation is so subtle to judge, to point out what we've done, to try to make it, to try to be holy and not rely on Jesus. I'm not saying that we shouldn't live better lives. I'm not saying that we shouldn't change, but it's opportunity, not law. Because the law will always, as St. Paul writes, always be that which will hold us accountable in front of God. So it is the gospel, it is the good news that frees us, it is the good news that helps us to understand the beauty and the peace and the joy that Jesus is delivering to us. And people do understand that. People struggle with this issue of needing to do things and feeling like they need to justify themselves, but they understand that need for forgiveness and God's love. And the amazing part, my friends, is we get to share the message. We get to share the message with other people, but we do it best when we remove judgment. We do it best when we stand up for how we should love God and how we should love one another. And by the way, those are the commandments, because that's what Jesus says. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the commandments. That's the summation of the Ten Commandments. So no one's denying the law. We're simply saying that the gospel is what comes and fulfills the law. Jesus is the one who comes and fulfills the law and puts us in a place where we no longer need to judge one another. We need to proclaim the gospel. Proclaim the word in season and out. Share with one another through our words and through our deeds and through our lack of judgment and proclaim that free gift, that free gift of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. You 
stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fails Will you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the gospel message, one which we, in our sinful brokenness, tend to discount, tend to forget, tend to leave behind, even though its beauty and peace and joy is the most uplifting thing in our lives. We pray that you would remind us each and every day, Lord, of the fact that we are your beloved, that we do not need to judge, that we are free from our sins, that we are holy and undefiled, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who are sick and in need of your healing touch. We ask that you would be with them and bless them. We ask that you would walk beside them. But Lord, we also ask that you would give them a vision of understanding that this world is just for a short period of time, that any sufferings we may go through are nothing in comparison to the glory we will be provided when we are in heaven. And we pray that while we would mourn their losses, we would also rejoice even more so in the gift that they have received. Be with those who have lost loved ones. Help them to rejoice. Bring peace into their hearts. Take away the pain and the sorrow. Help them to see that we live in you and that you will have us live forever in that place where there will be no sickness, no sorrow, no tears, just joy in your presence. Lord, we pray for those who do not yet know that joy, for those who still live in judgment, who still believe that they are doing things that are wrong and they cannot get through it, for those who believe that they can save themselves. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit and that you would send your Holy Spirit through our words and through our actions and through other ways to reach them and to show them that you love them and that you sent your son Jesus to die for them. So Lord, be with us as we see those opportunities and help us to seek those opportunities as well. We pray for those who are celebrating. We ask that you would be with those who are celebrating birthdays, and anniversaries, with those who are celebrating the transition of their loved ones from life on this earth to life eternal. And we pray that you would be with them and bless them in all the things that they're doing. Be with us in our vocations, Lord. Whether our vocations make us famous or wealthy, or whether they just make us people who do our jobs and are barely seen, be with us in our vocations, Lord. Help us to share your message of faith with other people in all that we do, and help us to know that you have given us that opportunity to share that greatest gift of all. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. If you're watching this on October 31st, tonight we'll be out on the corner handing out candy to the children like we have for close to 20 years now, celebrating All Hallows' Even. It's been, become the word Halloween, but back in Luther's time and before, it was All Hallows' Even, the eve before All Saints' Day. And November 1st, All Saints' Day is the day that we celebrate the people who've gone on to heaven. We struggle with that sometimes these days. We struggle with what does it mean to recognize that people have left this earth. But it is a day to celebrate. And it is a day to celebrate because Jesus has opened wide the gates of heaven. 
because Jesus has taken away the sins of the world. So again, I say to you, happy Halloween, because it is an opportunity to celebrate those who have gone before us, and I pray that you will. And now we receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.